I've been eating home-baked pies and puds since I was a lad. Now I want to inspire you to rediscover this delicious, hearty food. Hello and welcome to Pies and Puds. Today I'll be making some of my favourite traditional recipes with the UK's finest ingredients. Here's what's coming up. I head for the hills of Scotland to take the bull by the horns as I go in search of buffalo meat. Wow, these are much bigger than I thought they were going to be. I have a face-off against a protective mum as I get to work tagging calves on the farm. If you can bake a scone, you can put a tag in the calves here, I promise. <laughs> City boy. And back in my kitchen, there's a meaty treat. Great quality meat, gorgeous pastry on the top. That is a proper buffalo and ale pie. Jamming with strawberries? I set three expert jam makers a challenge to find the finest fruit for a perfect preserve, including the strawberry of the future, which isn't even on sale yet. This is one of the latest selections in our breeding programme. It's not been released yet. This is in very short supply. This is the only fruit we've got. And I'll pick a winner to bring a hearty helping of love to my baking. This is a love cake. Isn't that, that sweet? sweet. <laughs> Delicious desserts the American way, I'm joined by the masters of stateside sweetness who show me how to rustle up a tasty and towering layered treat. We've taken the apple butter and we're just laying it between each of the layers. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's visually, it's, it's, it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> and I fly the flag for Britain when I show them how we do things at home by making a meaty suet pudding. Oh, wow. And there you have it. My guests join me in a feast of all today's dishes. Steak and ale pie is an all-time British favourite and a recipe I've been baking for years. But I want to take this pie a step further. So with that in mind, I headed off in search of the ultimate meaty flavour. My quest has brought me to this food show in Dundee, and I arrived to the welcoming whiff of sizzling steak, or buffalo steak to be precise. I'm here to discover whether buffalo could maximize the meaty taste of my pie, and the man who wants to convince me has a stall right here. It's farmer Steve Mitchell. Steve. How are you doing? Nice to meet you, mate. How are you doing? Right. Now, I want a proper beef. Sure. Okay. I've never actually cooked with buffalo before. And is this the sort of range you're looking at then? Because it looks like exactly the same. It's probably one of the biggest advantages of the buffalo is that we're not trying to re-educate. We're selling all the same cuts as you would get with beef. It's actually a lot healthier, the equivalent of half the fat of beef. I can hear you almost saying immediately, oh, fat, that's flavour, but it's got the same amount of fat, but the, the consistency of the fat's very different. So a bit like your olive oil against your vegetable oil. You know, both are bad for you, but one much less bad. That's all very interesting, but the proof will be in the eating. So, let the people decide, starting with me. Now, that's the buffalo. Lots of flavour. Texture's there, it's got a bite to it, but it's not chewy. It's just got more to it, it's more meat to it. Now, the cow. Nice flavour. A bit more chewier than the buffalo, actually. It's probably the cut. But then you lose the flavour in the cow quicker than you do in the buffalo. The buffalo flavour hangs round more. I'm sold, but what will other people make of the differences between the two meats? And will they have any beef about eating buffalo? Excuse me, would you like to try this? T take a toothpick. Time for the taste test. First, the buffalo. Oh, that is delicious, isn't it? That's lovely. Yeah. Really nice. Okay, that's really very nice. It doesn't taste quite beefy, but it's nice. And now for the beef. Not a big lot of difference in them. So which was that one? That's buffalo. That's cow. Oh, no. The buffalo has a better texture. That's the buffalo. That's the cow. No way. That's gorgeous. It's just a bit more tender. Yeah. It's got more flavour. There's more seasoning to it. I thought the buffalo was very tender and very, very tasty. And it's tender. It's more tender. That buffalo was much nicer. It was uh, more flavoursome. 
So it's a thumbs up for Farmer Steve's buffalo meat. Well, from the people of Dundee at least. But tasting the meat is one thing. I want to visit Steve's farm so I can see exactly where it comes from. One thing you're going to have to watch out for, they have rather large horns. You always have to keep your wits about you. I made that fatal mistake exactly this time last year and ended up spending four weeks in hospital as a consequence. Where? Oh, right where you really, really wouldn't want it. <laughs> and you can't get it stitched. Really? Really. I'm just... I think I'm busy, actually, uh, <laughs> Steve. Anyway, lovely meeting you, mate. You too. <laughs> City boy. <laughs> I'd say more cowboy myself. Staring fear in the face, I head to Clentry Farm near Kilcoddy, where Steve keeps a herd of 350 water buffalo, which he's grown from 100 animals which he brought over from Romania. We're obviously going to, uh, rather than walk in, we'll take the quad bikes. Yeah. Uh, There's a bit of a good enjoy one. Enjoy your ride there, mate. <laughs> oh, I'm getting the wrong one. Ever. Let's go. Steve also farms Aberdeen Angus and Jacob Lamb, but it's his puddled up buffalo meat that I've got in mind for my steak and ale pie. Wow, these are much bigger than I thought they were going to be, to be yeah. honest. These are females. These are breeding cows, yeah. These are big animals living in a big landscape. I mean, now I've, I've got a feeling of how these animals live, and it's so hilly as well, and you've got such lush grass. We don't feed any concentrates at all, so it's, it's purely grass-based. It's all slow and easy with the buffalo. Nothing, nothing can be done in a hurry, right down to how you herd them to how you look after them, but the result is a really, really tasty product. And when you look at that view, you think, yeah, even I could live here. <laughs> But I'm not here to look at the scenery. I'm after buffalo meat for my pie, and Steve's going to make me earn it. So what have you got me doing? If you're feeling brave enough, we can maybe you can help me tag some calves. OK. Yeah. Uh, they got horns. Well, not the calves yet. have little horns, but the horns you're going to have to watch out for is the mum's horns. They're quite big. Right. We're tagging their babies, so they could be a little bit protective. Fantastic. That cheers <laughs> me up now, and lead the way. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Steve wasn't joking. As soon as I arrive, there's a protective mother who seems a little too keen to meet me. The sanctuary of my kitchen suddenly feels a long way away. You can bake a scone, you can put a tag in the calves here, I promise. <laughs> so says the man who ended up in a hospital recently. So what we're going to do here is, I've obviously got the cows on this side and the calves here. Yeah. We just let one cow round at a time, let it tell us which calf's ours. The calves are born in the fields unassisted, so there's no telling which calf belongs to which mother. To reunite them, one mother at a time is brought to the group to pick out her calf. Tell you what, Paul, if we get a boy, I'll name it after you. Oh, I think there's a couple. So we've decided it's a, the shiny calf, Paul, OK? Yeah, it is. All we've got to do now is separate mother from calf. And when I say we, I mean they, of course. Have you seen the size of those horns? It's the same colour as my Labrador. <laughs> it'll hurt a little bit, but it'll be over very quickly, OK? I'm a natural at talking bull. With that one's mum having that lovely bit of silver hair in its forehead, what, do you think we should name this one after you? Uh, yeah, OK. Would you be happy for that one to be? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Silver fox, you think? Go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You have to look after this one now. You have to come back and visit. I'll, I'll, I'll be its godfather. Yes. Come on in, Silver Fox. Yeah. This could be a prime breeding bull. You never know. It could be the one. Well, it's certainly showing plenty of promise as a youngster. It's a good calf. Perfect. <laughs> I've got a buffalo named after me. <laughs> Fattened up on West Fife's finest grazing, the puddled up buffalo is sold at farmers markets and traditional local butchers. Hello. Hello, nice to meet you. How are you doing, guys? Yes, of course. John the butcher stocks an array of buffalo, from upmarket rum steak and silver side to cheaper cuts like shin and top side. What do you think of the flavour difference between a cow and a buffalo? It's a slightly stronger flavour, mm. but not much difference. 
What cut do you think I should use for a steak and ale pie? A steak and ale pie, I would go for the, the side rump, what we call the side rump up here. Nice texture, slight touch of gristle on it, which gives it a bit of flavour as well when it's cooked. Melt down lovely. That inside the pie, I think, will go extremely well. Probably not that much leaner. It's just the equivalent of half the fat. If you were looking at one of our Aberdeen Angus rumps there, it would be pretty similar. But if you look at the coastal that fat, it's very white in comparison to beef fat. It's more, more digestible by the body. So you're still crucially getting the same amount of fat to carry the flavour through, keep the meat moist and juicy to eat. OK, I'm bought and sold on the fact that I'm going to use buffalo. When it comes to the ale, I'll leave that to you. That's a taste test I'll enjoy. Absolutely. <laughs> I think I've chosen wisely. I mean, the buffalo that we saw today has been reared fantastically. And I can't believe I've got a buffalo named after me. Well, sort of me. Joining me all the way from Puddled Up Prairie is Buffalo Steve. Hi, Steve. How are you How doing? How are we doing? I'm good. When I left you at the farm, I was so filled with testosterone driving that quad bike and sort of checking out all the buffaloes. I went for two breakfasts. <laughs> 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 I was arm wrestling everybody. You weren't good in the cod, mate. Yeah, no, it was good fun. How is the uh, silver fox? He's doing well, yeah. No, no, I've got my bill for maintenance with me, so... Oh, uh, don't, don't, don't. No, he's a wee character, actually. <laughs> right, what I'm going to do is a steak and ale pie with that sort of flaky lid, I think, would work quite well, that butteriness that comes through. Now, running through the ingredients I've got here, obviously, you've brought down the ale. Do you drink this a lot? Well, I just believe that... When we're making a pie, there's you know no point putting a second-rate product in. You know, put in quality, we'll get out quality. So it's a very good beer, I think. Oh, it's got lots of depth of flavour, and it's got a strong pepperiness that sort of runs across the top as well, which would go really well with that steak. How many bottles did you bring down with you? <laughs> well, there's a couple less than uh, when I set off. <laughs> good lad. <laughs> <laughs> to start things off, warm your pan and then add some oil and butter. I've already coated the meat in flour, which will help it brown. Look at the way this meat's colouring. It's cooking a lot quicker than normal beef. What reason do you think that is? I'd certainly put that down to the fat. Right. I mean, the fact that it's a slightly little bit leaner well, as well. A lean cut because from, don't yeah. forget, the fat would melt on a normal beef, and that would obviously coat it, and that would protect it almost. But this hasn't got that. The brown's beginning to happen. You may call that caramelisation, aren't you? Caramelisation, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> you get you get all fancy on me yeah, now, I just do. I, I did pick up. You've been down here too long, you know. I'm going to take this off the heat now. It smells fantastic. All right, get out of my way. Go and sit down. Do you want some beer? Uh, well, we 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 glass would be nice. I don't know if I've got enough left. <laughs> well, you've probably eaten drunk too much of it on the way back. Take the brown meat out of the pan. Then chop a carrot and add some shallots, mushroom sauce and a bit of brown sugar to help with caramelisation. Then some tomato puree and a drop of ale before Steve drinks it all. I realise this is going to be recreated at Edinburgh Farmer's Market. We'll have the Paul Hollywood pies. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you come over here a sec, let me just cut this out a bit. All the flour that was coated in that steak and has gone down to the bottom. Yeah, yeah, and it's see formed it. the little scrapings. I'm just releasing all them from the bottom, because that's where the flavour is. You smell that? No, it's lovely. It's lovely, isn't it? That is going to be the heart of, that goes inside the, the pie. It's a shame you haven't got smell-o-vision. It's absolutely delicious. To add moisture and flavour to your pie, pour in the rest of the ale and some beef stock and stir. Then, Add the buffalo back into the pan. Add a few sprigs of thyme, season with salt and pepper, and bring to the boil. Then reduce the heat and simmer gently for about an hour until the meat is beautifully tender. Right, so the next job for me, this is the pastry bit. I'm looking for it. Don't be letting me down. I'm not going to. I want a bit of horns on it. You manage that? Yes. In fact, uh, yes. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. For the pastry. Get your bowl of flour and salt and add a squeeze of lemon juice. Add some lard and butter and break it up into crumbs using your fingers. This is what we call a flaky pastry. It's made like a puff pastry, but in a different way. A, I'm using lard, B, I'm putting clumps in rather than sheets of butter, which I'm going to show you how to do now. You do this all the time, Steve, I can tell. <laughs> then you add the water to it. Just turn it around, see how much flour is getting picked up by that liquid. You don't want this dough too, too wet. If I just bring that together, you end up with a dough like that. Now, because 
it's going to be a rough puff. You want a bit of strength. You don't want this thing to break too easily. Now, pop your dough in the fridge for half an hour to solidify the lard and the butter. And I'll show you how it incorporates in. So imagine this is the dough that you've rested. And all you do is you roll your pastry out, and then with the rest of the butter and the lard, you cover two thirds of it. You then fold it over and fold it again. That's what we call a turn. That then goes back in the fridge, and you want to leave it in there until it solidifies again. Now, it freezes probably better because it stings it and it takes about 15, 20 minutes. You then bring it out, roll it out again, and then fold it again. That's a second turn. Now, this dough's had four turns. I've just given it another turn. Right, I'll get that filling out of the fridge. Pour the filling into the pie dish. Add a line of pastry around the outside rim to help the lid stick. Lay your dough over the top and, using your hands, bind it to the rim. Trim off any excess with a knife and crimp the edges with your fingers. So that's your basic pie. On top of that, though, so we can roll up a piece of dough because it's buffalo, a couple of corns. That is our buffalo pie ready to go in the oven. Now, this is going to be baked at 200 degrees C for about 35 minutes. <laughs> now, over here, that is a proper buffalo and ale pie. Great quality meat. Can't wait to tuck in. And it's even decorated with horns. This hearty, wholesome pie will bring comfort and warmth to any mealtime. Steve, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we get a chance to eat it. Can't wait, can't wait. Looking forward to it. Still to come, I send three jam makers to track down the finest fruit to make a perfect preserve. <laughs> I can hear that squelch. That's brilliant. Which I use to fill my bake with love. And it's called... A love cake. Whoever I give this to can be very special indeed. <laughs> and I'll be slamming the lamb into a delicious savoury pudding as I celebrate the joy of suet. That's that suet. is suet. And the peasants had animals. They didn't want to waste anything. So we grate it down into something like that. It seals off the pastry. And there's more delicious pies and puds. When American bakers David Muniz and David Leshniak first met, it was a match made in cake heaven. They've since brought their mutual love of all things home-baked over to the UK and now run a highly successful all-American-style bake shop in West London. Today, they've shown me something rather special, a six-tier American apple stack. Wow. I mean, it's... Big, it's bold, there's plenty of textures, plenty of colours. Where did this passion for baking come from? Neither one of us were really trained. Uh, it's just something we kind of got started doing as a, a pastime. Whereabouts are you from in the States? Uh, I'm from New Jersey, just outside New York, and he grew up in Mississippi. Oh, wow, there's a bit of a difference there, then. Deep South, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, culturally, the difference between the two, two states is different, the way they attack their food and the way that they bake. So when you came together to come up with this idea, was it fascinating to see how things morphed? It was a challenge to, to mix the two, because, I mean, from the South, we're always correct. So <laughs> it made it very challenging for David, I think, to incorporate any of the North in there. Yeah. They also like everything extremely sweet. Yes. The sweeter, the better. Generally, what do you think about um, British baking, then? Funny enough, when we started researching where our recipes came from and the stuff that we call heritage recipes back home, a lot of them have their roots here, and it's just mm -hmm. stuff we brought over and we've just changed over the years. I think British baking is a little bit more traditional, whereas at home, you don't know where the source comes from. I find it fascinating, actually. When I was looking at recipes from people from all over the States, I looked at a recipe, which is a, uh, basically a fruit cake. Yeah. I saw a little bit of British in there. Oh, yeah. I saw some French. Yeah. I saw some Italian. And then I saw some German in there. So again, that's what America is. It's the hodgepodge. It's the melting yeah. pot of cultures and recipes. Yeah. And, and you've come up with something that is unique. I think it's all fascinating. Now, I believe you're going you're gonna to bake uh, an apple cake. Yes, an apple stack. That's something else. Yeah. <laughs> How many people will that feed? Uh, uh, maybe uh, six. Six? <laughs> yeah. Surprisingly, you can make quite a thin slice and it will stay together, so we've gotten 16 yeah. out of that easily. Oh, yeah, at least. So this is my kitchen. Be my guest. Absolutely, thank you. Over to David and David to get the stack started. 
So um, just like any cake, we're gonna start with creaming our, our butter and sugar, and we also have our sorghum as one of the sugars that we're gonna be incorporating. What, what, what's this? It's sugar cane, but just like maple syrup is sort of just tapped from the tree and then pasteurized, have a taste of it. Wow, that's, it's, it is a cross between um, black treacle, molasses, and malt extract. Yeah. It's sort of blend between all three. That's incredible. I noticed as well, um, when I was looking at recipes, they're all still in pounds and ounces. I mean, what happened in America? Have you cups. not caught up? We do cups. cups. Come on now. Yeah. What is, I mean, that, that infuriated me when I was over there. You know, I, 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 I was just saying, well done with the whisk. I'll is get there a low one. speed? Am I missing something here? Just push it down towards you. Oh. There you go. Oh, that's fancy. Fancy equipment. It's American. <laughs> What were we saying? I mean, pounds and ounces and cups, yeah. I mean, it, it infuriates me. Why can't you just go, you know, grams, kilos and liters? We tried. We tried I, I'm we a, kids, but I'm a child of um, that time when they tried to switch over and it just didn't work. It didn't stick. The Davids start their cake batter by creaming together butter and brown sugar in one bowl and mixing the dry ingredients separately. So what have you got inside there now? So what we've done, we've creamed the butter and, and our, our sugar together, and we've combined our salt, our, our rising agents, and our flour have all been combined, and then we're gonna do all of our liquid together. In this case, we, we use a lot of buttermilk, mm -hmm. and it's very much like a muffin mix. You just wanna yeah. do it just Just almost, so it comes together. Right. Next, David adds the sorghum to the cream, butter, and sugar. Sorghum is a classic ingredient in the dishes from the deep south, but I've never seen it over here the Davids import it, but you could use molasses or cane syrup instead. Next, in go the dry ingredients, and lastly, the whisked egg and buttermilk mixture. While the Davids bake, I'm surrounded by a selection of their transatlantic treats. So what's that? That's what we call our Snickers bar. So it's made with peanut butter in the batter, yeah. chocolate chips and peanuts, and then we make a caramel and sprinkle it with American salted peanuts. I thought it would be sweeter. I mean, I've had a lot of sweet stuff, to be honest. But that's, yeah, I like that. That's delicious. While David fills the cake tins, I'm still filling my face. What's this one? That's what we call a fudge bar. So it's an oatmeal crust, top and bottom, a chocolate fudge, and then it has Smarties in it. So, I think it shuts me off. <laughs> Have another bite, then. <laughs> Enjoy. May all your whoopies collapse. <laughs> The six separate cake layers are baked at 175 degrees for 10 to 12 minutes. While I quality test a whoopie pie, David assembles the apple stack with layers of homemade apple butter. Fruit butters are sweet paste and can be made from virtually any fruit. They're really popular in American baking. Think peanut butter just with apple or pumpkin. Would you serve it normally as six stack, or is that just something you decided to do? No, normally, it, classically, it's served as a six stack. I'm looking forward to try that in a bit. Now, thank you very much for bringing all this amazing uh, baking wear to here. I mean, I love that, by the way. Great whoopie pie. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks love the colour. After seeing David and David rustle up their all-American apple stack, I want to give them a true taste of Britain. So I'll be back later with a traditional savoury treat. Oh, it smells fantastic. It's a lamb and potato suet pudding. Jam tarts, Victoria sponges, roly polies, none of them would be the same without the strawberry jam filling. But I wanted to know which strawberries make the best jam. And who better to help me find out than the experts? Meet Hilary, Elaine, and Natasha. My team of jam makers from East Morling Women's Institute in Kent each with years of experience in perfecting preserves. They've accepted my challenge to find the finest British strawberries for their jam, but from three very different places. Hillary's going for an everyday option. Paul's challenged me to make some strawberry jam using supermarket basic range strawberries. And I'm here choosing some strawberries that have been grown locally, about 10 miles away. They're nice uniform size, which is what I want good smell, means they're nice and fresh, should be ripe enough. There's a huge selection here, and my problem is choosing the best ones. I think they're all looking rather splendid. Just going to go for it. Meanwhile, Elaine's hoping that posher produce means better fruit. Paul 
Paul's asked me to get a really good strawberry, so I've come to a local farm shop. I'm looking for some strawberries that are not too ripe, because if they're too ripe, they won't set, and that are not underripe. They're a good size, not too big, but not too small either, because if they're too small, then all you're going to get is a load of seed in your mouth. I think this one looks about right. The ripeness of fruit is important in jam making, and so too is the level of pectin. Pectin is found in the skins, cores and pips of fruit and helps jam to set. Strawberry jam is quite difficult to get a set because there's not much pectin in the fruit. Whilst you don't want it to be underripe, you want them to be just nice and ripe so that they've got um, enough pectin in there and a bit of acidity. So you need lemons to help it to set and then hopefully you'll get a set. Getting her jam to set is a concern for Hillary too. I've got quite a tough challenge using supermarket strawberries because they've possibly been grown under cover rather than ripened in the sunshine, so they might not have a good pectin content. While Hilary and Elaine are shopping for the best of British, Natasha's taking a scientific approach to her strawberries with a visit to East Morling Horticultural Research Centre where they use the appliance of science to develop the strawberry of the future. The strawberry industry in the UK has been a real success story. Growers have been very progressive in their ideas, not take of, of new varieties that we're breeding here at East Morning. Of course, we've got the climate, which <laughs> is very conducive to strawberry growing. Lots of moisture, which gives that real sweet sugar acid balance. So with the ideal growing conditions, what choices does Natasha have? We're looking at 13,000 strawberries here. They're all different. Every single one of them's got its own traits. But we hope that within all of these plants here, there will be one new strawberry for the future that will be out there in probably about eight years' time. One option Natasha doesn't have is to wait. My recipe requires jam, so the future needs to happen now. So I need the best strawberries to take away with me today. So which do you think would make the best jam? This is one of our latest selections. It hasn't even got a name yet. This isn't even out in the supermarkets yet. The only dilemma that we've got is obviously because these are grown commercially, we've got lots of fruit. With this one, we've only got actually got 10 plants. It gives us a very small crop, so... It limits how much I can take away. So it limits today, how much then. you can take away. And if you're able to make jam with this small amount, then you're welcome to take it. Well, I'm sure Paul would rather quality than quantity. I should take those with me and, and see what we can do with those. Well, that's it, short supply, so it's got to be special. <laughs> Back at the supermarket, Hillary's confident she's got the prize-winning punnets. OK, bye. OK, I'm ready. I've got my strawberries, cheap and cheerful, ready for the challenge to make Paul a brilliant jam. Fingers crossed. Right, well, I'll, I'll take those. I'll have three, and that allows four. And at the farm shop, Elaine feels she's got the cream of the crop. OK, thanks. thanks. Bye. bye. But they, do, they smell delicious. So that's another, they've got a lovely ripe strawberry smell, that slightly tangy smell. You can almost taste the sun on them. Natasha's hopes lie with her fruit of the future. Thank you very much, thank you. Normally I would use at least twice as many as these, but because there are only 10 plants, this is as much as we could be given today. I shall just try my best. Reunited in the kitchen, it's time for the ladies to compare their strawberries, starting with Hillary's. Mm. They are nice. I don't know whether they'd be really good for jam. They're, They're not very tart, are they? Mm. A bit of tartness is good, as it balances the sugar to give the jam a better flavour. Ripe or even slightly underripe strawberries will have more of that important setting agent, pectin. The flavour is excellent with yours. I yes. would think they'd make yeah, a good jam. They were really nice. Mm. Mm, yours are tarter. That right. is amazing. Mm. That's it's quite sweet. different, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. A good jam needs a balance between the fruit and the sugar. And it seems that what Natasha's strawberries lack in quantity, they make up for in quality. They were just like sun and the tongue. They were really luscious, they were sweet, they were super. I think they'll make a great jam. Time to put those strawberries to the test. And in the spirit of fairness, I've asked the ladies to use exactly the same recipe. Cleared for action. <laughs> I can hear that squelch. That's brilliant. <laughs> I obviously like to play with my food. This is good. And it's in with the lemon to help release that setting agent, pectin. It's a lovely colour. Mm. Now the ladies are going all high-tech with this fancy device. It's a jammy gadget, I guess. Oh, I'm at 60. 
This is a refractometer and it, it measures the level of sugar or the percentage of sugar in the jam. And if it's about 60%, then it should be at a set. Mm. So with all that measuring, pouring, mashing, boiling and um, testing, the jams are ready. OK, three pots of jam. There we go. Well done. So will it be jam made of strawberries from the supermarket, the farm shop, or from the future that I choose for my pud? Let the jam judging begin. Joining me now are our jam makers, Elaine and Natasha. Where's Hilary? She's on holiday in Croatia. She's really, really sorry, sorry that she couldn't come. It's but not good enough. It was booked already, so, yeah. It's not good enough. Um, so, can you tell me about the jam that we've got here? How difficult is it to actually make strawberry jam? It's quite difficult, actually, because strawberries don't set very well in jam, so you've really got to be make sure that you've got the right kind of strawberry to get it to set, mm -hmm. otherwise you end up with something that pours. I and mean, if you want a sauce, you, you know, you can easily end up with a sauce instead of a jam with strawberry. And it would be really interesting to see if these jams have actually set, because they all behave differently, they're all different strawberries. Can we start with Hillary's, actually, while she's not here? means I can, if I say bad things about her, she can't hit me. Um, <laughs> we'll do it for her. Now, this is the one made with the supermarket oh, yeah. strawberries. We all use the same recipe, so it should give you a good idea of the strawberries. So it's the same recipe as yeah, well? OK. Yeah. It's a very loose set. Mm, it is. Hillary has a refractometer, and it was all more than 60%, yes. all of our jams. The texture's OK, it's a bit watery. It's quite peppery, I find. You know, mm. almost a spice yeah. at the end. Do you know what I mean? It's very sweet. Mm. Her strawberries are very soft and they produced a lot of juice. So if we move on to yours, Elaine, this one here. Now, this one was made with the, the farmer's markets. Yeah. I mean, you expect a good quality strawberry. It, yes, they were really nice strawberries. It's a bit thicker than uh, Hillary's, to be honest. It's got more to it. But it's still, it's still what I would call quite a loose set. Definitely more tart mm. than, than the first one. That one's definitely the strawberries sweeter. Were. And it was the same recipe. Yep. So it exactly comes down to the strawberry. It comes down to the strawberry. If we're running in sequence, I'd say that one's better than that one. OK, fine, let's try yours, Natasha. Oh, the moment of truth. Now, this is the one that was the, the very special strawberry that's coming out in a couple of years. Absolutely. It's so new, it doesn't actually have a name yet. Is there a letter? No, just a very long just number. a strawberry. Oh, it's a number, <laughs> so we call it EF45671B. OK. <laughs> very different. Very, very different. I could tell when I was making it that it was going to set really hard. It just went really quickly. Great flavour. It's, it's a lot thicker. It's very great thick. Great flavour. And a good blend of the sweetness as well. It feels like the tartness of the strawberry against the sweetness of the sugar has actually come up with a great taste in jam. Mm, it's quite balanced, isn't it? Very kind of old-fashioned flavour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what it is, like an old-fashioned flavour. Summer on the spoon. I mean, it's, it's, um, I like it's that. lovely. Summer on a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> they only had ten plants, mm. only ten available, so they've picked as much fruit off it as they could that morning. So this is a very, very rare jam. I'm going to use this mm -hmm. for my recipe, and it's called a love cake. Now, in some parts of the country, it's called a courting cake, given to the person that you're with to show them how much you love them. Now, this, obviously, using a very rare strawberry, whoever I give this to, can be very special indeed. <laughs> to my bowl of flour, I'm adding corn flour to thicken, some sugar, a little bit of salt, and some lard. The reason why I put lard in there, actually, it helps seal the pastry. Then add milk, a little at a time, and mix it. And now I'm going to get my hands in there, and it's getting near the end. And I would say that will actually do. Crush it all in the bowl. Begin to fold it in on itself. At this stage, I'm going to work it slightly, but not too much. At the moment, you see it's it cracking very easily. Yeah. I'm going to work it past that stage. What it's actually doing is it's building up the gluten. You see, it breaks very easy. It almost looks like a hot water crust pastry. Mm. And I'm happy with that at the moment. Now, you begin to roll it out. I'm just going to turn it into a rectangle, a rough rectangle. Keep on turning it again. So there you have a very rough rectangle. I'm happy with that. Add some jam and spread it out evenly across the pastry. Fold over the top edge and roll it up. 
Seal the ends and taper them off slightly. Now, this is a love cake. So what you turn a love cake into, well, there's only one thing you can, a heart. And there you have it. Heart shape goes onto the tray. Isn't that, that sweet? sweet. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Brush with milk and prick with a knife to help the steam escape. And pop it in the oven at 200 degrees C for 20 minutes. So that is a love cake from the past, ironically with strawberry jam from the future. When it's finished, we'll have a chance to eat it. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds great. You'll love this sweet jam-packed love cake. It's perfect to share with someone special or to enjoy all by yourself. Earlier, my guests David and David brought a taste of the US to my kitchen. I mean, pounds and ounces and cups, yeah. I mean, it, it infuriates me. Why can't you just go grams, kilos and litres? We like? tried and it just didn't work. It didn't stick. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my turn to repay the favour. With something traditionally British, a steam pudding. I'm going to make a British pudding with a heritage that stretches back to the beginning of the 17th century, if not earlier. This is a lamb and kidney suet pudding with rosemary. How does that sound, guys? That sounds good. You're probably a little bit nervous about the suet. I totally understand. Actually, I'm more nervous about the kidney at this point. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Why? Don't you like it? I've never had it, so it's all, it's all going to be new. OK. Add your lamb to the flour, which will help thicken the gravy later. Put some oil in a pan, drop in the meat, and leave it to brown. Now, the whole thing about suet, That's that suet. is suet. It's the fat from mutton or beef. It's the part that's around attached to all the waste organs. Going back 500 years, when the peasants had animals, they didn't want to waste anything. So they used to use the fat to render down the food. What happens is it seals, so it stops the juices from coming out because it's the fat itself. Okay. So we grate it down into something like that, dry it out, is it seals off the pastry. So it was a very useful way of using it in steamed pies. But you know, from a steak, the fat is where the flavour comes yeah, from. Yeah. It melts, and that's what infuses. It's the same with this. You can't use any other fat to do the same thing? You can. Butter will do a certain degree of it, but it'll also add flavour. But the point is, this has been around for so long now that it does a job, but it also imparts flavour. And I think the only way I can do that is to cook it, let you eat it, yeah. and then the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Once browned, pop the meat onto a plate. Pour some red wine into the pan and add some chopped onions, shallots and garlic. Then add stock. Do you guys like kidney? No. N no, I'm sorry. OK. OK. That's absolutely fine. So what I'll do is I'll leave the kidney on the suet. What I'm going to replace the kidney with is potatoes. Happy with that? Love potatoes. OK. I have got some potatoes in the fridge, which at this stage I'll put straight in there. And I'll cook them out just for a couple more minutes. And the rest of the time it'll cook inside the suet pastry itself. Now, you need to leave that to cool down and pop it in the fridge. Now, moving on to the suet crust. Over here I have my flour. Into a bowl of flour, add some baking powder to open it up and pop in the suet. Before baking powder came about, was anything else added? Eggs would have been a rising agent using the, the whipped egg. But to be honest with you, certainly in things like bread, and it, it would have made a sourdough or used a balm from a beer to rise and made a levain. And so the whole idea of rising agents when they came through is, it was new. Roughly chop some rosemary and add to the bowl with a little bit of water. Then mix it all together. OK, there's your basic suet crust pastry. So I'm just going to work this together just to form a smoother dough. Rip a piece off. That one's going to be for the lid. Now, this is going to be the lining for this. This is the pot. Again, quite a traditional thing, actually. It's been rubbed with fat. Roll out your pastry, making sure it's thick enough to hold that rich, luxurious filling and drop it inside the bowl. So I've worked it enough just to be able to line wow. the inside. Now what we need to do is get our filling out, which we've got some in the fridge. It's been cooled. Pop all the mixture into the pudding. 
Oh, it smells fantastic. All those lovely juices. I'm just going to put a little disc onto the top. Does it look good so far, guys? Is it, it worrying looks, you too much? It looks great so far. <laughs> <laughs> Took that in. How many will that serve? Probably serve a good four. Because of the growth, it's got the baking powder in. This will grow slightly in balloon as it, as it steams. So we put a slight pleat in it, and that goes over the top to allow for that extra bit of growth. Tie some string around the rim of the bowl and across the top to act as a handle. The whole thing goes into a pan with water underneath, and you need to steam this for about two hours. Let's go over here and look at this one. This one has been steaming for two hours. Let's lift it out. Imagine you have Christmas puddings done exactly the same way. Oh, wow. wow. And there you have it. That's more colour than I thought, given yeah. what you were saying. It's brought, it. it's brought on some colour. Let's see if this guy will come out. Are you nervous? Yes. Oh. Oh, wow. wow. There you go. Wow. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little bit nervous then. But it's all come out in one piece, and that it's a lamb and potato suet pudding. Indulge in this British baked classic and let its flavours and richness give you a comforting hug. Gentlemen, you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer before we can try it. Can't wait. It's been great to welcome new friends to help me create some wonderful dishes today. There's Steve, whose buffalo beefed up the taste of my steak and ale pie. David and David, who made their apple stack cake, which I answered with my lamb suet pudding. And Natasha and Elaine, who took up the challenge to make their tasty jam for my love cake. Well, this is my favourite part of the day, where we actually get a chance to eat the food that we've made. So I think we just need to tuck in, really. I mean, don't, don't be shy, just take what you want. I think I'll start with the suet while it's nice and hot. Put you a scoopful. I'd love some of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Like... that buffalo pie as well. Okay. You've got to try it. It is stunning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a yes. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. I'm intrigued to see how you serve that. Oh. The size yeah. of that. I don't think you've got a plate big enough. We're just putting enough. it anywhere, right? Yeah, exactly. Just get it on there. <laughs> <laughs> It's the worst plate of food I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> this buffalo is lovely. It's so tender. That ale's coming through as well. Mm. It's fantastic, and yeah, the, the crust is really good as well. The meat's not as strong as I thought it was going to be. No. It's very subtle. It is absolutely delicious, and I love your pastry. I think it could definitely be a new product in the butcher shops very soon. It's, it's delicious. David and David, suet. Good. Really good, and surprisingly light. Oh. Now I want to try it with the kidney. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try that love cake, actually. Jam is absolutely delicious. Jam's very tart, isn't it? It is. It's nice. Yeah. As if it was a very sweet jam, it would just be a bit cloying, wouldn't it, to mm. eat? And this is, it would be lost in the pastry. Mm. That apple layer cake's delicious. And it's not too sweet. It's been great today, and I hope you feel inspired to cook some of these delicious recipes. Cheers, guys. To Buffalo Strawberries in the US of A. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.